In this video, I'm going to show you how to build a real-time chat application using Go on the back end and TypeScript on the front end. But the focus of this video is going to be on the Go back end where I cover web sockets, concurrency, and Go routines. And if you stick around for the entire video, I'm going to show you how I actually deploy this application and you can go and visit and use it right now. Okay, so I'm going to start this video with a quick demo of what we're going to build, uh, but you can actually use it right now. It's called yapper.chat. So if you go to yapper.chat, it takes you to this login page. You can continue as a guest or make an account and log in. I'm going to log in right now. Okay, and you can see when you log in, you agree with a bunch of these kind of topics and these community rooms. So a topic is just a room where you can talk. You can see this is just a topic that I pull from Reddit and another one from Hacker News. You can see this message is, hi, I'm Melky. This is another message. This is a third message. You can create that. Uh, you can also create a room. So you can say like my new room, click create room. There you go. And you can see it's empty. Um, and I can actually have this other window right here. And if I continue as a guest, you can see here, uh, my new room, I can be like, hi, I'm a guest. And if I put these side by side, you can see that you can basically see the message as it go through. So the left screen is my logged in user Melky. I can be like, oh, hello there. You can see on this right screen, I see it right away. I can even look at the profile of this Melky dev individual, while for an anonymous user, you can't really see anything because, well, they're anonymous. And you can see the point of this video is I'm gonna show you how to build these rooms out and how we can create a very strong web socket connection that you can communicate between these two uh, sockets in a chat room type setting. Hello, subscribe to Melky. Now for the rest of the video, I'm gonna break down these four kind of branches. One is why I think Go is a perfect language for real-time chat applications. We're gonna explore different facts about it. I'm gonna show you the project setup. I then I'm gonna show you the core functionality of how we handling the message and creating the rooms. And lastly, like I said, I'll show you how I deploy the application to yapper.chat. It's live, it's secure, you can use it. So I'm gonna show you all this in this video right now. So I'm going to start off explaining why I think Go is a perfect language for real-time chat applications. But regardless of whatever language you use right now, there's always a demand for real-time communication solutions, either between services or a client to your service like the demo I just showed you. Now, the reason why I like Go for these types of applications is because of Go routines and channels. Go routines allow me to spin up a separate thread, a lightweight thread with basically two keywords, Go and Funk, that will run alongside my main Go routine from the main.go uh, function or as many Go routines as I need in my application. And then my channels allow me to communicate between these Go routines very easily. So these come out of box from the Go programming language and it just makes developing these types of applications very easy. Uh, and the next thing is really kind of batteries included. On top of Go routines and channels, Go has a very rich net slash HTTP library, a WebSocket library. The ecosystem has different libraries on GitHub or wherever, wherever that allows us to create these applications that require WebSocket, WebSockets, concurrencies, and Go routines. Super easy. The documentation's all there. There's lots of support in the community. So I thought this was a very good reason to add why Go is a suitable language for these types of apps. And the last reason is Go's fast execution speed. And this is kind of crucial when you want to handle real-time traffic without introducing lag in your app for your users. All right, so now I'll talk about the project structure and I kept it fairly basic. There's three main components to it. There's this root of the project, which just contains my Docker compose files because I'm using Docker files for both my client, my server and my database. So I'm spinning up a lightweight database using Postgres image. That's how I like to use all my kind of development for Postgres before I kind of send it to production environments. And I have one for my dev environment, my production environment, I have my claw.md. Then I have my client directory. This is basically spun up using Vite. It's a React TypeScript project. It's not too fancy. I'm not gonna go into details of what's inside. If you are interested, there's a GitHub link to this project in the description down below. You can contribute to it if you want. But I'll be mainly focusing in the server where I've defined the entire backend for the application. And I'll go through each of these directories one by one. I'll start off with the util directory. This, I know a lot of people don't like util directories in Go, but I do. I think it's pretty easy. I have something for like my response.go, which allows me to just create a write JSON function and a write error JSON function. When I send back responses uh, through HTTP, I have something for the passwords, uh, how I handle environments with this little function here. 
and I think they're pretty handy. Uh, but moving on to the router.go, I'm using Qi for my application. I actually think Qi is one of the superior backend uh, frameworks they can use in Go, but they're all truly the same. So pick your poison. And I'm using Qi with uh, JWT and cookies. It makes it super easy for me. I have all my routes defined here with my WebSocket routes. And I then have my middleware with an auth.go. This just handles everything from my jots and my cookie auth. I'm not using OAuth, I'm kind of rolling it my own. It's pretty simple, nothing too crazy. It's all available on GitHub. And then I have these two directories for internal and DB. DB is a little bit more straightforward. It has a bunch of my migrations, so all the things I've defined from my user schemas, my uh, room schemas, uh, pin schemas, etc. This migrate.go, which allows me to spin up all those SQL schemas into my application on startup. And then I have this simple db.go, which allows me just to connect to my database pretty easily. But the real meat and potatoes of this app comes in the internal directory. We have my API, uh, this filter, this is for filtering out curse words, my repo, service, and web sockets. This follows a pretty standard kind of DDD pattern. Uh, and starting with the API, you can see I have my model definitions for my user and what I like to call core, which is just the rooms that you saw earlier. And then I have this handler directory, which has handlers set up for the core stats and users so for every user there's like a create user handler a struct for the user which is just the user handler a uh, constructor for it and just some simple functions that are actually queried from the front end and this is a very restful uh, architecture nothing too crazy and then I have my service repositories for very pretty much the same thing. And my API handlers typically call it my service layer. So if I follow the same pattern of the users, my user service has kind of the business logic of the application where I do some validation. I check certain credentials. Like here, I'm checking if the password is, you know, less than or greater than six characters. And I'm doing a bunch of other things of this nature, which then call the repo service of user.go. And this is kind of the database layer. So if you're following, I always have my API handler for my RESTful and CRUD operations receiving payloads from my client that then calls the business logic in my service layer, which then calls the database logic in my repo layer. And this is a pretty common pattern in Go. This is one that I enjoy a lot, but this is basically how I set up a lot of the architecture for the application. So the real interesting part of this application, the reason why I'm probably watching is actually all in this WS directory. We have this client.go and this core.go file. And I'm, go, and I'm gonna go through each of them individually, starting with the client.go file. So the client.go file depends on this library from Gorilla WebSocket. This is what helping me use WebSockets in the application. And you can see here, I have two different structs, one for client and one for message. The client struct represents a connected user to a room and it holds the actual WebSocket connection here, the message channel, the ID of the user, the room ID, and the username of the user connected to the room. And then lastly, I have this message struct, which represents the content of what a message should hold, which is the content, the room ID of where that message is being sent to, the username, the user ID, and the system. And this represents if the message was sent by the user or if it's them leaving or entering the room. Now, the first method I have on the client struct is basically read message. And all it's doing is it's listening to the socket and it turns the incoming frames from the channel into messages. And then you can see here, this is done right here. So it's listening for the content from the read message method up here. And it's taken that, turning into a string, grabbing the room ID, username, and the user ID, transforming it into a message struct, and then passing that down into my broadcast channel, which I'm then listening to in the core.go file. Now, the second function I have is the write message method. And basically all it's doing is it listens on the c.message channel and it writes JSON to the socket. And it closes the connection when the channel closes. So it's a fairly straightforward implementation. And this is basically how I handle writing the messages and reading them from the socket. All right, now, so core.go is a little more complicated, but it follows the same structure. You can see here, I have this room struct, which basically defines every room. And then the more interesting part is this core struct. Now, the core struct is kind of like the hub that coordinates everything. You can see there's a bunch of different channels, but everything from rooms to users entering to messages being sent to users leaving to broadcasting, 
everything is coordinated through this core shrug. And it's really kind of like the nucleus of an app of this application. And you can see we have different uh, channels here. So we have rooms. So we define all the rooms that we have, all living rooms and their current state. We have a register. So if a user enters a room, unregister if a user leaves the room. We have this broadcast channel, which is the queue of messages to fan out. It's buffered uh, to handle spikes in any kind of incoming load. And then we have the room and stats repo on DB. And this just allows to communicate directly with kind of stats of your room or different things that could happen in a room that want to persist to our database. And so this has one core function called run. And you can see I have a comment here that says this coral run in a different go routine. And if you go to my main dot go, you can see I have the definition of the function here, my main dot go, uh, or my main function, excuse me. And I have the function here after step all my service and handlers, I just have in a separate go routine, this run function. And this basically just listens to all the channels. And it has a select statement here, which effectively is like a switch statement put specifically for go routine to communicate and channel to communicate. And it's listening for all of the incoming uh, channels that we have. So you can see here our register channel, we have one for our unregistering. So again, leaving the room and our broadcast channel, which I put here fan out for all the possible messages we're getting for all the recurrent rooms that exist in the hub. So I'll focus on this run function, which is basically the event loop of everything that happens. The first case that we're listening to is registering. So if a user enters a room, I have some logic that validates that that user actually exists in the room or not. I have a separate go funk that basically looks for the room ID. It's able to also get the messages from the room. So if a user enters a, a room, we want to show them all the historical messages that existed in the room before they joined. So when you go to yapper.chat, you go to a room, you'll see all the historic messages that exist there. We didn't have the case for unregistering. So basically, if a user exits the room, we're able to listen to that and we can close their channel and delete any kind of history that that user still belongs in that room, which is good because you don't want to have any kind of lingering uh, WebSocket connections hanging in your application. And the last channel, which is kind of like the meat and potato of this event loop is the broadcast where we're listening to all the different messages that exist in our application for any given room. And this function does a lot of things. First, it listens and appends to the room history, then it persists those messages it then um, increments any sender stats or awards. So we have stats and awards that for a user is sending lots of messages and they read a search. If they reach a certain threshold of messages, they'll get an award for their account. And then it fans the messages out to every client that exists in the room. So if you go back to the example here, if there's multiple different clients at any given room, if I send a message, hello, it does all those things. It incremented my message for this user. It then sends that message to all the different uh, channels that are connected to this room. And we move this forward for all the possible rooms we have in this application. All right, so if you stuck around for the end of this video, I'm gonna explain how I deploy my application. But if you've been a long time viewer, you'd already know I use Coolify. Now, Coolify is a self hosting service. It's created by Andreas. He's one of my really good friends. I really love the guy. You can see here, he even added PFG Labs on the list of sponsors. And if you don't know, PFG Labs is a Go platform learning service I created that uses Coolify. And if you put the pieces together, what I'm basically doing is I have a Linux Hetzner box that I bought very cheap. And then I have this Docker Compose prod file, which orchestrates my Docker file from my server and my Docker file from my client. And then I spin them Coolify in that Linux Hetzner box, which just orchestrates those two Docker files. And it pretty much does it for me. You can see I have my build logs. I can have both applications for my server and my client. And all of this allows me to spin up my service relatively easily, and which is how we can go on yapper.chat and use it today. Now, if you also want to see a full end to end deployment video of how I use Coolify, I have a link description down below on how I use Coolify. But if you also want to make, if you want to see me make a new video on using Coolify from scratch, let me know in the comment section down below. I'll gladly make that video. All right. Thank you for watching this video. I greatly appreciate it, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed. I know it's probably long. Again, the code is in the description down below. Contribute to it. Check it out. Check out Yapper. Let me know what you guys think. And if you guys have any recommendations for any YouTube videos in the future, let me know. I'll gladly try to do them. I know I haven't been posting as much. I've been doing that on purpose just because I don't really like the drama scenes happening in tech kind of content creation space. It seems like the only content people watch are drama related. I kind of want to stay away from it. 
Although I don't want to be programming coding and showing you guys how I code line by line. So I want to keep these things pretty abstract and hopefully cover topics you find interesting. So if there's a topic you want me to cover, let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.